We give God the glory, the honor, and praise for another opportunity to bring to you the Apostolic Renewal Show from the Network of Churches. And um, for a couple of weeks, we have been looking at prophetic gates and apostolic foundations, looking at the New Jerusalem, the holy city of God, as um, it was revealed to John the Apostle in um, the island of Patmos. And um, in that revelation, he sees the holy Jerusalem descend out of heaven, and that is the bride. The bride is the church of the living God. and. Um, we have progressed into understanding um, the structure of the New Testament church as it pertains to leadership. And um, we've been looking at the fivefold, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love hallelujah it's a very beautiful scripture and so far we've been able to look at the ministry of the apostle as is distinct from the ministry of the prophet and um, the ministry of the evangelist and this morning i'll skip the ministry of the pastor in the order in which is given and teach about the ministry of the teacher and then i'll come back uh, god willing next week to the ministry of the of the pastor. Now, um, the purpose of the fivefold ministry leadership of the church is to ensure that we become perfected for the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ will be built. And the Bible says, till we all come to the unity of the faith, which is a progression we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is possible for us to grow up to become a full representation of who Christ is. Amen. A full representation of who Christ is so people can see Christ in us. It is possible for people to see Christ in us. That is the measure of a perfect man, the measure of Christ. For people to be able to experience Christ when they encounter us. That is the purpose of the fivefold, to, to help us develop and achieve maturity and completion so that we become like ripe fruits ready to be eaten up ripe fruits that become a blessing to whoever we come in a contact with so that we become a tremendous blessing to the world amen and as you as you will have it right as we will have it right now um the body of christ has not really become a a ripe fruit for the world to eat so we find out that um, um and rather we leave a bitter taste a sour taste in the, in the mouth of um, so many, even amongst ourselves, we, we, we are like unripened fruits. And when you eat fruits that are not ripe, that's sour aftertaste. 
you know, but um, it's, a, it's a process, it's a progression that brings us into the, the full measure of Christ. A perfect man, a complete man, a mature man, a ripe fruit. Hallelujah. Amen. Stable. An edifice. A beautiful, glorious edifice. As it was shown to John the Revelator. Oh, the, the gates were made out of precious pearls and the foundations are of, of very beautiful, beautiful precious stones. And... Um, it was a glorious, glorious sight to John the Revelator, the, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. And so there is a progression that brings us uh, into that state, into that edifice that everyone wants to be a part of. Hallelujah. The church becomes attractive, not because we compromise to mainstream ideologies, but because we exemplify the fullness of the measure of Christ. Until today, even till today, the world acknowledges that Christ indeed came. Christ manifested. So the date, the, the dates are named after his death, after Christ, because he was a significant impact on the world, indelible, uh, unquestionable impact on the world. Amen. In the same way, we can also become of great influence, of great significance to families, to lives. Uh, uh, without a shadow of doubt, our impact uh, will, be, will be very clear and um, appreciated. Hallelujah, from generation to generation. That is the measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the edifice of Christ, which was shown to John the Revelator. And um, this morning, we, we are making our progression to focus on the office of the teacher. In the same manner as um, the office of the apostle is a distinct office, yet we are called to be apostolic people. Amen. That means that regardless of where God has called us, God says, I will do, behold, I will do a new thing. Whether it's in engineering that we are called to, or uh, fashion, or, or, or retail, or, or marketing, no matter the vocation wherewith we are called, God says, behold, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth. Amen. It shall spring forth. That means God has called us to be creative people, to bara, to birth new things. That is the essence of the apostolic. So even though we are not all called to the office of the apostles, we are called to be apostolic, to birth new things in the various careers and vocations that God has called us into. Um, in the same vein, we have the office of the prophet. That means some, some people are called distinctly into the office of the prophet. But at the same time, as a New Testament church, Christians are called to be prophetic people. That's why on the day of Pentecost, when there was an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it came upon all of them, and they were, they were blessed, baptized in the Holy Ghost. For once, they all could speak in tongues, other tongues. They were blessed with the gifts of the Spirit. Some of them could prophesy. Some of them had the gifts of word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and, 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 and gifts of miracles, gifts of healings. So we are all, as a New Testament church, called to be a prophetic people. Yet, in the same vein, there are those who are called specifically into the office of the prophet. And they groom us. They, they help us to mature in the prophetic. And they bring a balance. And they help us discern spiritual things so that um, uh, um, we don't become victims uh, of, the, of the occultic, of, the, of, um, of, of false spirits. Also, with the office of the evangelist, it's a unique office. Some people are called into the office of the evangelist. But in the same vein, we have all New Testament believers called to be an evangelistic people. We are to win souls. 
we are to we are to witness about the love of Christ but the office of the evangelist is the office that grooms us and matures us in our work of marketplace um, um, uh, witnessing, marketplace ministries where we, we can all witness wherever we work to our clients, our customers, to our colleagues, co-workers, you know, on the streets, on the train. The evangelist um, 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 trains us, the evangelist leads us also into unique um, uh, um, evangelistic missions and, and to take new territories for the kingdom. So the evangelist makes sh is, the, is the kind of the marketer. He makes sure that constantly we are reaching out to the world. Amen. That's the office of the evangelist. And then today we want to look at the office of the teacher. Just as much as um, we have a distinct office of the teacher, we are all as a New Testament church we're called to teach the word of God. We're called to teach the word of God. Now, the teacher, let me talk about the office of the teacher uh, for a moment before we, we, we come down to the level of every believer knowing how to teach to some level. Amen. Now, the office of the teacher is... A unique office is a very unique office now um, Jesus gave as a commission in Matthew chapter 28 and um, verse 18 after he resurrected and um, Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now Jesus is giving his disciples a commission. He says, go you therefore, first of all he starts, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now go you therefore and teach all nations. Go you therefore and teach some of your translation says, make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Now the word disciples or disciple is the same word from which we have discipline. Discipline. Now, all those who followed Jesus, who were around Jesus, when he was alive, were all generally referred to as disciples. Amen? They were dis regarded to as disciples. And then he chose 12 amongst these disciples whom he designated as apostles. But all those other people like Mary, like uh, uh, Martha, like uh, Lazarus, and all those people who followed him, who were with him, were considered disciples because they were brought into a certain discipline. They were brought into a certain discipline through teaching. They listened to Jesus. They were taught by him and conducted themselves in the manner that he had taught them. Amen. The manner that he had taught them. Jesus taught the crowds. He taught them be attitudes. He taught them the principles of the kingdom. Hallelujah. He taught them the mysteries of the kingdom. 
he made the word come alive to them and those who committed themselves to these teachings the scripture says that at a point he sent the 12 out to the cities where he will he will go to to prepare the way to announce his coming to preach to witness and then the scripture says that at another point he sent 70 beyond the 12 beyond the 12 who he had designated as apostles he sent 70 that means that beyond the 12 there were other disciples people who had come into the discipline of living according to the teachings so these were disciples so in this scripture jesus is giving them the great commission he says go you into all the world and make disciples notice they were disciples of jesus they had come into the discipline of what jesus taught now jesus is saying you go and make disciples go and make disciples now go and teach people what i taught you go and bring others into the discipline that i brought you into hallelujah so you notice that that is the pattern for growth in the new testament church like we saw in Ephesians chapter 4, he says the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to bring us all into, into, into growth, to become an edifice, and also to produce increase. So the authentic way by which we increase as a New Testament church is the concept of discipleship. I say that again the authentic way by which we grow as a new testament church is through the concept of discipleship the concept of discipleship where we are brought into a certain discipline the bible says very clearly in isaiah chapter 28 when he when when the prophet isaiah uh, um, 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 is granted insights into the kingdom to prophesy about how the church of god is going to look like in isaiah chapter 28 um, and i read that we've been studying that in the co last couple of weeks uh, uh, verse verse 9 uh, isaiah chapter 28 from verse 9 says whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Notice that he says he teaches his knowledge. He grants the understanding of doctrine to them who are weaned from the milk. Them that are, sorry, weaned from the milk uh -huh, and drawn from the breast. So you are nurtured like a mother nurtures a baby that she has birthed. A baby that she has birthed with breast milk and training, grooming that child, weaning that child. That is what Jesus did to those who he considered his disciples. He weaned them. He trained them on the basics of the kingdom. And then he sent them out. He sent them out to witness. They came back and said, oh, we see results. In your name, we cast out devils. In your name, we heal the sick. We saw signs and wonders multiply. And he says, don't even rejoice in that. The big deal is that your names are written in heaven. Your candidates of eternal life. You're doing what it takes to be a part of the heavenly Jerusalem. You're doing what it takes to have eternal life. Hallelujah. So discipleship is like a mother birthing a child. And nurturing that child with milk and training that child. 
And sometimes when a child is growing and he, he, he touches something that he's not uh, 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 supposed to touch, uh, touch as the child starts to crawl, then you, you, you begin to tell the child, no, this, no, that, no. They're telling the child uh, the boundaries, what they can do and what they cannot do, even though they have not yet started speaking. But you are instilling in them a discipline. A discipline. That's why the Apostle Paul talks to the Galatians, Galatian church. He says, my children, for whom I travel in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. My little children for whom I travel in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Amen. That's the process of discipleship. Jesus traveled. Jesus prayed for them. Jesus weaned them. Jesus gave them milk and, and, and went on to teach them deeper things of the kingdom. Hallelujah. He went on to teach them deeper things about the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So that's how, that's how we make a progression in, the, in spiritual things. So when the apostle says in Galatians chapter 4 verse 19, My little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He was talking about the essence of discipleship which is the kingdom, the authentic kingdom concept by which we grow. The authentic kingdom concept for growth of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ is through the concept of discipleship. The Apostle Paul groomed Timothy, groomed Titus, hallelujah. And, and now let's look at a very interesting Let's uh, um, 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 look at a very interesting uh, story in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, I'll, I'll read from verse 1 to 4, and um, we'll progress from there. Acts chapter 18, from verse 1 to 4. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now notice something that Paul came to Corinth and found a Jew named Aquila with his wife Priscilla. Amen. And the Bible says they were of the same occupation. They were all tent makers. Paul had a profession um, apart from being an apostle. So he was bivocational. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and at the same time he was a tent maker. Amen. Praise God. I do the same thing. I'm a publisher as, as well as being a, a, being 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 um, called to to God's work. Now the 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 apostle Paul uh, began to fraternize with this um, this couple uh, uh, Aquila and uh, Priscilla, and the Bible says that every Sabbath they'll go into the synagogue, and the apostle Paul will teach. The Apostle Paul would teach. And so for a long time, Aquila and Priscilla received from the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They received from the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, the apostolic office is a birthing office. 
an office that births new things. And when we say new things, we do not mean that these new revelation that comes um, to the apostles are entirely out of the framework of scriptures. It is a birthing of new understandings that God gives the apostles into the word. Jesus Christ establishes that precedent. Jesus Christ is the chief apostle and he says, I have not come to teach you anything new. I have come to bring new understandings, new insights into the ancient landmarks. Truths that have already been given, but we have not been able to comprehend it yet. So we bring you new insights. King Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. What, 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 what is has already been. But the office of the apostle is, 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 is crafted or is an office that allows these men of God who are called into that office to bring us new insights into truths that have already been. Yet we've been ignorant of them. But because of the work of Jesus on the cross, like Apostle, like, like Ephesians chapter 4 says, he descended first to the lowest. And he contended with the kingdom of darkness, which clouded under normal circumstances, we, we, we should have always have, had, have access to this, but for the sin of Adam, Satan stole the dominion and put dust, covered those wells like in the days of Abraham. When Abraham died, the, the Philistines seized the wells of Abraham and covered it with dust, covered it with stones. So that's Satan's speciality. He's a thief. And Satan thrives on our ignorance. So Jesus descended to the lowest and took back through the cross. He took back what the enemy had stolen from us. First, the first thing the enemy steals from us is knowledge. You see in the Garden of Eden, he comes in and he twists what God has said to Eve. So from that time, we are masked, we're veiled, we become blinded to truths that God has already abundantly showered upon us. So Jesus descended to the lowest and took captivity captive and the scripture says he gave gifts unto man. And then the scripture begins to talk about the, the, the offices, the fivefold ministry, apostleship. So apostleship grants the church the ability to unveil, to come into the, the, the understanding of truths so that mysteries become clear. And that's what Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. He says that um, um, the mystery of Christ is unveiled unto me. The mystery of Christ, so that unto the church shall be known the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the Apostle Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1 that, 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 that the, the church in Ephesus shall be granted the spirit of understanding. The spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Christ. So that they could come into the fullness of the knowledge of the riches of glory in Christ Jesus. It all starts with the unveiling of revelation knowledge. So the apostle Paul schools Prisla and um, sorry Aqu Aquila who is, which was the man and um, uh, Prisla who was his wife schools them and um, when we continue to read the Bible says that when, when Paul departs from, from there, um, um, Priscilla and Aquila actually goes with, continues to travel with the Apostle Paul. So they became kind of disciples of Paul when it comes to the things of the kingdom.
they began to travel with Paul from place to place. Now, um, when we go all the way down to verse um, 24, now, actually let me start from verse um, 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, the, let me continue to read. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, held them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, you notice a process that has taken place here. The apostle Paul disciples Aquila and Priscilla. Amen. Now, when the Apostle Paul leaves Aquila and Priscilla, the scripture says that here comes Apollos. And Apollos, the scripture describes him as eloquent. He was a good communicator mighty in the scriptures. Here is um, Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus and here comes this man of God. The scripture says he's a good communicator and he's mighty in the scriptures. That tells us immediately that he was a teacher. He was a gifted teacher. But notice that the Bible says that he was limited to the teaching on the baptism of John. That means that he had been schooled in the revelation about water baptism. He had been saved, yet had not been schooled in the fullness of the ministry of Jesus Christ. So to the degree to which he had been taught, he was a very good communicator. He simplified the word of God. That's what the scripture refers to as being mighty in the scriptures. You see, when you listen to a teacher expose the mysteries of the, of the word of God, you, you, you get instant clarity. That's the office of the teacher. You get instant clarity. Instant clarity. So he was mighty in the scriptures. He brought the scriptures to light. He made it very clear. But the Bible says that he was limited. But notice that Aquila and Priscilla, listening to um, um, Apollos, sees that he's called into the office of the teacher. Yet, he is limited in scope. But Aquila and Priscilla have a more increased insight into the kingdom by reason of the apostolic ministry of Paul. They have been exposed to new truths. New insights, which it was very obvious that um, uh, Apollos wasn't aware. So now, just as Aquila and Priscilla have been discipled by the Apostle Paul, now they, they 
call Apollos aside and say, you're great in the scriptures. We appreciate there's an anointing upon you to teach. But in the same token, you have to come into new truths. So Aquila and Priscilla expand the scope of Apollos as a teacher. And because Apollos receives these apostolic truths that was passed on from the Apostle Paul through Aquila and Priscilla to him because he received them, the Bible says that now when he was moving on to Achaia, the scripture says that the church in Ephesus wrote letters of commendation for Apollos to say that he has been with us. He has been discipled by us for a season. He's a credible teacher. He's a credible teacher. And when he got to Achaia, the scripture says that he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So you notice that because his scope had been expanded, he could minister more effectively as a teacher about Jesus Christ. Before he came to Ephesus, he was, he was more mighty in the ministry of John the Baptist. But after being discipled by Aquila and Priscilla, he came into the fullness of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the ministry of Jesus Christ. So it's an upgrade. Hallelujah. The apostolic brings us an upgrade when it comes to the things of the kingdom. And the apostle Peter always also spoke about that. He says, there are some people who resist the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They want to be conservative, stuck to what they have known. And not, and not willing to appreciate, embrace new things. But they show that they, they are not groomed, they are not weaned, they are not discipled. They don't have the spirit of discipleship. Hallelujah. They don't have the spirit of discipleship. And so Apostle Peter calls such people unlearned, untrained. If you understand discipleship, then you must understand that there is always a progression. You must always grow. You must always be a student of life. And be open. Now you notice that, um, um, so, um, the ministry of Apollos becomes very effective. Now, after Paul, the Apostle Paul has planted the Corinthian church, the scripture says, and, and has moved on, later on Apollos comes to the, to the Corinthian church. And uh, impacts them for a season. Now he has a different style from the Apostle Paul. He has a different style. He's a teacher. His style is different. The Bible calls him eloquent. The Apostle Paul describes himself somewhere in the New Testament as, as, as one who wasn't really a smooth talker. <laughs> Amen. He describes himself as, 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 as having uh, not a great, such a great personality. Some theologians believe he was a very short man and probably bald-headed. So, so he didn't have that, the features of a very, of a very you know, um, um, articulate and um, uh, outstanding human figure, even though he came with new truths. But the, here is Apollos. Apollos, you know, uh, uh, even his name <laughs> alone gives you an impression of a, of a handsome, um, you know, uh, uh, man who has, um, you know, long hair, like, 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 like a typical Greek man, even though he's a Jew, like a typical Greek, Greek man, you know, you know, <laughs> knows how to carry himself on the pulpit very well, um, articulate, smooth, and um, also uh, very accurate. He makes the scriptures very very clear. I mean, if you put those um, 
two personalities in front of you. Paul, who is a house, Apollos, and, 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 and kind of a faction was developing within the church. But notice that Apollos is a grand child of the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah. Paul discipled Aquila and Priscilla, and Aquila and Priscilla discipled Apollos, and now Apollos is impacting the work of the Apostle Paul in Corinth. So the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian church, you guys are carnal, you don't get it. Who is, who am I and who is Apollos? We're just workers. I planted, Apollos watered, but the most important thing is that God is the one who gives the increase. As it were, I believe that some of your contention was that I believe this church is growing because of the work of, the, uh, um, 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 of, of Apollos. I believe that Paul uh, planted that church, it grew to a certain extent. But when Apollos came and um, he, he, he ministered to them, it, it allowed the church to move into another dimension of increase. A lot of people were attracted into the church. Now notice, notice two things. And uh, the ministry of the apostolic is to bring new truths, new insights to the body of Christ. But the ministry of the teacher is to perpetuate those new truths. After those new truths are birthed, the ministry of the teacher is to perpetuate it. So the apostle brings forth the new doctrine, but the teacher continues to teach those doctrines. The teacher continues to what? To teach those doctrines in the church, making sure that everyone who comes into the church comes into the knowledge of these doctrines. So the apostles establish new doctrines, bring us insight into the new doctrines, but the new, the, the new Testament teacher makes sure that those doctrines are communicated to the church at all levels. New, new uh, born believers, um, um, growing believers in the Lord, and even teachers to make sure that those cornerstones, those foundations, those pillars are secure. The teacher is the guardian of the Logos. Just as the prophet is the guardian of the Rima in the local church, the teacher is the guardian of the Logos. Now, the apostle births the new truth, the new insights. When he births the new insights, it is inspirational instruction. When the apostle births the new teaching or the new doctrine, we call it inspirational instruction. Because the apostle is inspired by the spirit. Like the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, these mysteries were revealed to me by the Spirit. Amen? So the Apostle, when he stands and ministers the Word of God, it is inspiring instruction, or he is inspired by the Spirit to birth these new truths or to bring clarity or to bring insights into truths. Fresh insights, new insights, practical insights, applicable insights. Amen? So it is a logos. When we say inspired instruction, it's a Rima Logos. It's a Rima Logos. 
Amen. So the word of the apostle, when the apostle brings forth doctrine, we never heard this before. We never knew the word of God in this light. He's planting is a, a, a pillar. The apostle Paul says, I'm a wise master builder. A wise master builder. In laying the foundations. And not any new foundation except that which is laid by Christ. He says, no new foundation can anyone lay except that which Christ has laid. So, 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 so he, he establishes the fact that it, it's just an unveiling of an ancient landmark. It's just making an ancient landmark relevant because Christ is the foundation of the church. He is the, he is the pillars, but we are unveiling Christ as he reveals it to us. So it's a rima because it is revealed. It is a locus because it is a landmark. It has always been there. But now, after it has been revealed by the apostle as a Rima Logos, the teacher takes it up as a Logos, pure Logos, because it has already been revealed. But now, bringing it to the church and making sure that the church is strong in these foundations, in these pillars. And that the church grows into these columns. And that everything the church does is in alignment with the columns, with the logos. So that is the office of the teacher. So here we have the Apostle Paul birthing new things in the Corinthian church. And then sometime later, Apollos comes. The things that the Apostle Paul is teaching that is it's strange to them. That makes them scratch their head. What is this new thing this guy is teaching? What is this? this these things are awesome, but, but they're hard to comprehend. But Apollos, who is a gifted teacher, he comes the same truths, but he breaks them down in such a way that they are like, wow, wow. So they, they have been wowed as Apollos <laughs> teaches them. Or like when the Apostle Paul is teaching. He's teaching. They're, they're getting it, but they're still scratching their head. The Apostle Peter says what he teaches is sometimes hard to understand because they are hard to be altered. Hard to be altered because they are they, they're new. It's not that they're entirely new, but we, we never saw things in that light. We read the scriptures, but we never understood it that way. Amen. And it's kind of tough to, to add it up in your mind. To understand. So for some people, um, um, if there are two meetings, and the Apostle Paul is in one, and Apollos is in the other, they will gladly go and sit in Apollos' meeting. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but the grandfather of Apollos is the Apostle Paul. You see what the two offices are doing? One office is birthing something. And, and notice that when you are birthing something, you know, it's a baby with a big head. <laughs> Trying to come through a very narrow, a narrow passage, a narrow canal. But, 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 but the teacher has received the baby. And now, uh, you know, if it's a baby girl, yeah, uh, put some ribbons on the head and <laughs> some pink colors and some, some, um, uh, what, what do you call, some bracelets and some nice shoes. And, and, and you look at the baby and say, wow, what have you done to this baby? Beautiful. But guess when the Apostle Paul gives birth to the baby? With blood all over it. <laughs> with blood all over it. Amen. We're happy there's a baby. But it's not a great sight. Until Apollos takes hold of that same baby. And starts to dress it up. And put some talcum powder around the baby's face. And you know, hallelujah. 
I, I love the ministry of Apollos. <laughs> it's easier to embrace that ministry. So you get, you see the dichotomy of these two ministries. The apostle, the, um, the, the, um, the, the apostle birthed the new truth, but when he birthed it, uh, um, um, we're trying to get it. Um, um, we get it, but we don't get it. But when a teacher takes hold, his gifts allows him to articulate it and makes, makes it easy for us to embrace. So the teacher is the custodian of the Logos. And so Jesus Christ said, go and disciple all nations. So the teacher is going to break down the word into different segments. In the book of, um, in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter, Hebrews chapter, chapter 6. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6. Amen. Praise God. From verse 1 it says, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection or maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And these will we do if God permits. Now you notice that the Apostle Paul is talking about various doctrines. And then he, he says that there are elementary doctrines, foundation of, which are foundational, repentance from dead works. When someone gets saved, they must understand the basic doctrines of Christ. What is repentance from dead works? Notice that when you get saved, you've been living, before you got saved, you were living in dead works. So when you get saved, you must understand what it means when you say, I have given my life to Christ. All things are passed away and all things are made brand new. You need to understand the fullness. What is adultery? What is fornication? What is lying? What is lasciviousness? What is debauchery? We need to understand all what, 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 what sin is, what is dead work, so that we don't go, we don't walk in these things as people who are saved. So that's why we have the new converts class. That's the department of the teacher. The teacher is in charge of the various classes in the church. Where he makes sure that those who are saved um, um, get the, 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 uh, the doctrine of the repentance from dead works. And then faith towards God. Basic faith. And then we go on to, to look at the doctrine of baptisms. You don't just baptize people. You, you need to teach them about the significance of water baptism. And then we have Holy Ghost baptism. They need to understand what it means to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then we go on to laying on of hands, which is a common practice in the New Testament church. What does it mean when we lay hands on you? It's usually strange to a lot of people when they come to church and we lay hands and people fall down. People come under the power. Some people actually leave the church. Uh, I remember several years ago, uh, uh, a couple came into the church, uh, uh, into the church that was pastoring a cry, and um, the wife wasn't comfortable. With the fact that the husband, as he was a very tall, gigantic man. And every time that uh, the power of God will come into the church, it will just uh, spin and fall. It was Sunday after Sunday. So she told her husband, no, 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 I don't like this church. That gets you embarrassed every Sunday. Uh, uh, so let's go back to, let's go back to a, a former church where, where there was no manifestation of the spirit. Where it was all calm and quiet and serene and sanctimonious <laughs> you know but the the teacher 
is in charge of that department. Not only that department, don't get me wrong, but also he crafts departments for those serving even as workers in the church. Those who want to mature to serve in departments, to serve in the praise team, to serve in all the various aspects of the church. Those who want to do something in the house of the Lord must be trained and equipped. And the teacher also teaches the church. He's in charge of doctrines. Most of the time the weekday services are designed. Weekday teaching services, Bible study. So that we can grow in the knowledge of the scriptures. Understand the various books of the Bible. Amen. So that's the, the office of the teacher. But the teacher teaches us so that we can also teach others. The teacher cannot teach all the classes in the church. In a big church. So he teaches us so that we can also teach others. And when we win souls to Christ, we must disciple them. You see, today in the New Testament church, there's a basic problem. We only, most of us only invite people to church. And when they come and they, they, they might tell us they like the experience or they don't like it. But we don't follow up with discipleship. Because we ourselves were never discipled. So we have a, a big back door in our churches where people get saved but they find their way out through the back door. That back door can only be closed through teaching, through discipleship. So people who come to church when we have invited them to church and they love it the next thing if they don't come the following week don't just call them and say why didn't you come to church the word you hear from church the basics of the kingdom start to teach them start to disciple them we love church bring church to them so you can imagine if all of us are bringing church to our colleagues co-workers our neighbors you realize that growth will start to take place as these people start to enjoy your discipleship they'll end up in church because if, if, if from you who are not even a fivefold and you 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 you're, you're you're enlightening them bringing growth to them then they they'll they'll eventually they'll start to come to church and when they start to come to church you know they'll be stable foundations would have already been laid in them so discipleship is the concept by which the church ought to grow and bring increase. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to end with that. It means immerse them in the knowledge of the Father, the knowledge of the Son, and the knowledge of the Holy Ghost. That is, that today many churches fight over whether you immerse people in water and invoke the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, he was talking about discipleship. Training people in the knowledge, in the fullness. Who is God the Father? Who is God the Son? Who is God the Holy Ghost? When people begin to understand who the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is, their functionality to us, that's when they grow to appreciate who God is. All too soon we've come to the knowledge, we've come to the end of our program this morning, and um, we'll continue next Tuesday by the grace of God, uh, uh, God willing to learn about the office of the pastor and how we are called to be a pastoral people. God richly bless you. See you on Thursday for the prayer breakfast, 9 a.m. Eastern time. God bless you.